Okay. So let's look at this. Um, extinction and speciation. Think back to the analogy of the birth of offspring and speciation. Uh, so speciation is kind of like the birth of taxa um, at whatever taxo taxonomic level. If speciation is analogous to birth, then extinction is actually akin to death. So, an individual, here we go, um, you know, let's say, here we go, um, death. Death. Well, the same thing happens with taxa. Here's a dead taxa. Here's some more dead taxa. These are living taxa that arose um, at some time in the past. Uh, since um, the Cambrian, 550 million years ago, there have been five mass extinctions. There have been actually others um, anytime there's a big change. Uh, sometimes it's by climate, sometimes it's uh, by volcanic activity, asteroids, whatever it is. Uh, so we can see here that there's the end Ordovician um, extinction, the late Devonian extinction, the biggest of the bunch was the end Permian extinction, the late Triassic extinction, and then the end Cretaceous uh, that wiped out the dinosaurs, and uh, a, an asteroid was actually um, found to have played a role in that. Um, the end Permian was the largest, as I said, about 90% of all species were lost. And then the end Cretaceous, about 60 to 80 percent of all species lost, um, and there was a, a smoke, the smoking gun for the asteroid was actually found. Uh, and Cretaceous is also known as the KT boundary between the end of the Cretaceous and the beginning of the Paleogene. So here's a um, question, did an asteroid kill the dinosaurs? Uh, the first thing that was found, actually, was this layer of iridium at about 65, 66 million years ago. Um, it was found worldwide. Uh, iridium is not common on Earth, but it is fairly common on asteroids. So, um, of course, once someone recognized that, um, this uh, team at Berkeley, actually, son, uh, father and son, uh, they predicted that uh, there, there would be a crater at some point. And then there are other things as well. Um, minerals that are formed to like this uh, shock quartz right here. Um, and then, uh, what is this? Oh yeah, microtectites as well. So all these things were found but of course the crater was the biggest um, and lo and behold at the very tip of um, the Yucatan Peninsula a uh, 210 to 220 kilometer wide crater was found, um, the outlines of one, uh, and in um, most of it is in the ocean, but they found it, and they found all these other things there as well. Um, and then if you actually look at this down here, this is where 
all these other kinds of things were found too. It, it causes a massive tsunami that you know went up into the United States and Mexico and all that. So mass extinctions reshape the biota. They have biota is every living thing. And how do they reshape them? Well, they kind of clear the decks. So they kill um, tremendous amounts of taxa. There's very few left over. There's low biodiversity following a mass extinction may persist for millions of years. As a biota recovers, in other words, as populations start rising, all these empty niches are there. There are remarkable ecological opportunities for survivors because there's much less competition. So did the KT extinction of the dinosaurs permit the adaptive radiation of mammals? Perhaps. Um, at the end of Cretaceous, the only dinosaurs that were left over were birds. And um, there were mammals well back into the Jurassic, but they um, certainly radiated. There was about a 10 million year um, period where there was um, the biota was really depressed and then it started to come back. And a lot of the niches that previously were filled by dinosaurs were then filled by mammals. So this is an adaptive radiation of mammals. Now an adaptive radiation means that there's a single taxa or a few taxa that are left over and from but from one lineage uh, all of a sudden, there are a bunch of different species. So here's some mammalian radiations um, in the Americas. Uh, a wolf, uh, South America, a tree sloth, um, a, I forget what it is, it's an anteater of some kind, um, an ocelot, a gray squirrel, and a bunny rabbit. These are all placental mammals. They all were part of radiation in the Americas, and, um, and then similar things were going on in Europe. Now, in Australia, Australia, remember, only really had marsupials, and so they had equivalents of a wolf, Tasmanian wolf, not related to a wolf at all, but filling the same ecological niche. Koala, similar to um, a tree sloth, um, a numbat, kind of a um, anteater, um, a western quoll, kind of the niche of a, of a medium-sized cat, um, Lead uh, betters, possum, like gray squirrel, and then um, bilka, I forget, let's see, bilby or rabbit bandicoot. Okay. Okay. Now, so, um, and this mass extinction event actually creates ecological opportunity. All these niches open up. Now, you can get the same sort of thing in terms of ecological opportunity if, in fact, you get colonists to, let's say, an island that has very few species on it, and these colonists then um, grow in population, if they can do that without going extinct, and then they may actually speciate. And so in the Hawaiian Islands, um, there were colonists faced a little competition. I mean, suddenly they, it was like a sweepstakes. They got there and there was nothing there, hardly. Um, these taxa and more underwent an adaptive radiation. Honey creepers, ticket, crickets, drosophila, uh, moths, silver swords, alliance. So these is the silver swords. Um, these are the drapanid honey eaters, these are the crickets, uh, these are the moths. Um, let's see, and I'm not sure uh, what those are. So, 
all of these, initially there were probably a single taxa, a few individuals that somehow made it to the Wine Islands, and they had a foothold. They, a lot of them uh, made it there like the Trapanids about five million years ago. So in other words, there was only Kauai. Then new islands started showing up. Um, there was dispersal to new islands, new species on new islands. And then finally, there's something called key innovations. It's called, actually, it's, um, we can say it's an exaptation. An adaptation for one function then evolves a new function in a new context. So, feathers showed up um, in dinosaurs. A lot of them actually um, had what looked like downy feathers. Some had um, more uh, body feathers. Um, this is one of those. Uh, looks kind of like a bird. It might have been a dinosaur-like bird. Um, and it was probably also used for so insulation and display. And it was only later flight feathers were actually used for flight. And once birds entered the open niche, new niche, because things could fly, of the air, uh, birds radiated to some, oh, probably 10 million species. Um, no, 10,000 species today. Um, evolution and depth of radiation of birds. I'll play this um, in class. So, there's a, a question. Why is there so much biodiversity? Um, we have all kinds of different bacteria. Oops. Um, bacteria. Um, oh, these were dinosaurs. They actually used uh, the feathers for display. Uh, this is a, a moth, a lizard, more bacteria, coral, hummingbird, mannequin, all these kinds of wildflowers, beetles, probably more beetles in terms of animals than in any other, a whole bunch of reef fish, Dinosaurs, um, rainforest, uh, parrots. So it's a it's a question. Um, obviously, there's been many species um, speciation, but of course, more species that were ever previous are, are extinct than the ones that are actually here today. And the ones that are here today are all from a, a common ancestor um, that was probably a, a bacteria or something like a bacteria. Um, life tends to create new niches. So if you have, um, um, let's say, this, this uh, lizard um, eating fruit and dispersing fruit, here's a pollinator. Um, uh, here you have a big carnivore, swimming carnivore, um, beetles, all these things. Um, the web of life creates more opportunities for uh, species to coexist. Okay, human evolution. Um, molecular estimates indicate the chimp human line uh, split about seven or seven and a half million years ago. Uh, which came first, evolution of bipedalism or increased brain size? It was definitely bipedalism. Um, the earliest um, individuals, um, including Australopithecus um, and early um, Homo, and right here, all had uh, really small brains about the size of a chimpanzee. Uh, Havilah started getting a larger brain, um, and then uh, finally we had Homo erectus, 
um, which had a very large brain, but not as large as ours. And then there was uh, Homo um, neanderthalensis, neanderthals, that had a brain uh, as big as ours. Here's us. And there was also some Denisovans. So many um, hominids or hominin species, um, human-like, lived uh, at the same time. Um, there's additional species of Homo, that's our genus, that are not shown. So why was there an increase in brain size? Now, it seems like, oh, well, being smart is, um, is a good thing. Well, uh, large brains require a tremendous amount of energy and food resources, and that's where we get our energy from. Uh, in fact, our brain uses at least 20% of all our energy that we actually use. So it's very expensive. And in fact, uh, they've done studies like uh, um, artificial selection, selecting for, let's say, smarter fruit flies. And they can do that, but uh, they usually, smarter fruit flies actually, have lower fitness. They leave fewer offspring. So in terms of increased brain size in, in, um, in the human lineage, um, Several lines of evidence support the hypothesis that natural selection um, favored the ability to reason and communicate. And was it triggered by increased tool use and language use? Or was increased um, language and tool use caused by bigger brains? Uh, so, here, right? Uh, what caused what? In any case, um, there was an increase in brain size from uh, uh, around the first Homo, Homo habilis, at um, about two and a half million years ago, I think. Um, there was a fair amount of climate change then um, that was fairly, it changed a lot over periods of time. So that might have had something to do with it. And then in terms of intelligence, well, there's some hypotheses for, um, well, what an intelligence is good for. And one of them is a cognitive map hypothesis. So here are some J's, pinion J's, and they remember where they put caches. And humans also have that kind of um, uh, uh, ability, but not like them. Um, sexual selection. So here's Einstein looking buff. And then the social brain or the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis. These are galatas, um, and they're kind of like baboons in Ethiopia. Um, they form big troops, and um, there's a lot of scheming going on, um, hierarchy, all that kind of stuff. And you have to be able to read other individuals that you're dealing with all the time. So, um, so here we have Neanderthal. Um, Neanderthal was actually shorter than modern humans, but much stockier. So this guy probably went about 250 or 300 pounds. Incredibly strong. Um, didn't use as much symbolic stuff as, as, as modern humans did in terms of cave paintings and all that. Um, here's skeletons as well. Um, Neanderthals went extinct uh, about oh, 25,000 or 20,000 years ago. Um, and at one point in Europe, oh, they were found mainly in Europe, um, and they lived at the same time as, as modern humans, Cro-Magnon man. Um, and whether Cro-Magnons actually sent them on to the road to extinction, no one quite knows. There was certainly, um, they were kind of adapted for cold climates or Pleistocene um, glaciation. Uh, and perhaps they just couldn't compete when it warmed up. But it turns out, um, this is kind of a, it shows how many differences there are between 
Neanderthal and human in terms of mitochondrial DNA. And there's 202 different substitutions. Um, between different humans, 44 and 99. And then there was this other group that was found in Siberia, just uh, uh, like a finger bone, a few other things. They thought it was a Neanderthal. And it turns out that it was, we call it a Denisovan. We don't have much material from it, um, but we were able to actually um, use new techniques for getting ancient DNA and we could put all that into a phylogeny using some statistical packages. So, um, the lineage that lent, led to Denisovans, Neanderthals, and humans, um, the, the Denisovans and Neanderthals split, and, um, and then later came the humans. So, Neanderthals diverged from Denisovans 640 million years ago, the whole lineage for humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans about a million years ago. Um, and humans, though, are uh, modern humans are only about 200,000 years old. Okay, so this is archaic Homo. Uh, Neanderthals spread east and west. There's the Denisovans up here. Um, and then we don't know the extent of the Denisovans. But we do know that, it turns out, um, Neanderthals and hum modern humans actually interbred. First in the Middle East, that's why you find it in Asians and Europeans. So they were out of Africa by then. And later on, another um, interbreeding between more Asian, with Asians again. And then the Denisovans um, bred with uh, um, a, a human migration out of Africa, um, around the Indian Ocean, and then down into Australia, where they reached about 40 or 50,000 years ago. And that population showed interbreeding between Denisovans and, mo and modern humans, and there was about 6% versus 2% 2, 2 or 4% for the Neanderthals. So these are some different hypotheses about where did modern humans originate. Um, there's this multi-regional hypothesis where several different erectus populations spread throughout um, Africa, um, Europe, Asia, the Americas, and then there was interbreeding and perhaps um, between all these different populations and we eventually got modern humans. Um, out of Africa, there was an initial modern human lineage coming out of Africa. So there's Homo erectus, these all went extinct. And then modern humans ended up in Africa, um, Europeans, Asians, and Americas. And this is no interbreeding. So, just one lineage, and they replaced uh, Neanderthals. And then the, there's another one called the leaky replacement, where there was some interbreeding between modern humans and um, Denisovans and Neanderthals. So, we can, these different hypotheses make different predictions. Um, first of all, uh, the time and place of anatomically modern humans. Where do we find their fossils? Um, in multi-regional, we should find modern human fossils around the same time, about a million years ago or something, at many different sites throughout the world. In the end of Africa, um, we should find only the oldest modern humans uh, fossils in Africa. And then after that, later, we find populations that have dispersed um, into Asia, the Middle East, then into Europe, and eventually into the Americas. Um, this one, there's no interbreeding. Okay. Um, also, 
in terms of genetic diversity. It makes a prediction since you have lineages that started in Africa, more mutations have time to accumulate because they're older. And so you have greater genetic diversity in Africa than anywhere else. That's a prediction for both out of Africa and the leaky replacement. And then the leaky replacement is the only one that has shows um, that would explain any interbreeding between Neanderthals and Denisovans and humans. So here we have these types of evidence. Um, and here's multi-regional out of Africa leaky replacement. So the oldest fossils um, for the multi-regional they should be randomly distributed for and this is AMHS, Anatomically Modern Human Homo Sapiens. Uh, the other two, out of Africa. That's where the oldest fossils should be. Location of ancestral alleles in the phylogeny. No consistent pattern. In Africa. In Africa. And then divergence time of African versus non-African populations. Greater than a million years. Less than 200,000, less than 200,000. Um, genetic diversity, equal in all three regions. Greater in Africa, Africa. And then the difference between the out of Africa and leaky replacement is that there should be um, gene flow here, but of course all these other ones, nothing like that. In out of Africa, there is no gene flow, but there actually was gene flow. In other words, we've all got some Neanderthal in us. So the leaky replacement hypothesis has the most support. And so um, this is where we have some fossils. Um, let's see. The oldest fossils were found around here, around 200,000 years ago in East Africa, Ethiopia. Um, 150,000 years ago in South Africa um, and West Africa. Uh, in the Middle East, no, uh, around 100,000 years. Europe, modern humans made it about 40,000 years. Um, Central Asia, about the same. Um, and then there was this big migration. Um, perhaps they made it to Australia 70 Oh, um, thousand years ago, but probably more like forty or fifty, um, thirty in East Asia, Southeast Asia. So there were, and then finally the Americas, much more recently, twenty thousand years ago. So this is kind of the dispersal out of Africa, and along the way there was in. So here's the earliest fossil evidence: um, Ethiopia, two hundred thousand years; the Middle East, one hundred thirty. 125, 100 um, other parts of Africa, um, like we showed. Um, Asia, Australia, at least 50,000 years. Europe, 40,000. Western Europe, 32,000. Um, and then there's also um, some fossils, questionable fossils. Before we had DNA, um, it was an ongoing debate uh, that seemed to indicate perhaps that there were kind of hybrids between Neanderthals and modern humans. Here's the genetic diversity and with out of Africa and the leaky replacement we have the most um, oops, uh, different kinds of alleles in Africa. The allelic diversity in Africa is much much greater than anywhere else. The further we get from it, the less diversity we have, less, and then finally, when we get to the Americas, less um, still. And also as well in uh, um, New Guinea and Australia. Let's see. So, haplotype diversity supports origin of most recent common ancestor of modern humans in Africa. And multi-regional predicts random origin, and we don't see origin. We don't see anything, anything like that. Okay. And then here's some evidence that we actually had from ancient DNA. Asians and Europeans share 
one to four percent of nuclear DNA. It looks like Asians and Neanderthal with Neanderthals, and Asians it looks like in a bread. So first in the Middle East, and that that population gave rise to both Europeans and Asians, and then Asians again later there was more gene genetic integration. Um, and then the Denisovans um, share four to six percent DNA with the Denisovans, this other archaic human population. And then in Africa, there's actually evidence of interbreeding between archaic Homo like Homo erectus and modern humans as well. So we can see some evidence of interbreeding if we actually look at this. Um, not only has mitochondrial DNA been recovered, but actually uh, nuclear DNA. So, uh, and then we ha also have even older fossils that um, kind of are the, they're more closely related to the Denisovans from about 400,000 years ago, um, but uh, closer to the split between uh, Denisovans and Neanderthals. And so here's the hypotheses again. Um, we don't get that, um, but we do get this and this, um, we do get this and this, but we don't get this, we don't get this, we don't get this, so multi-regional is kaput, um, and then of course, both these are the same, um, Genetic diversity, of course, greater in Africa. Um, and then, finally, the kicker is the gene, limited gene flow. Um, um, yes, but everything else goes away. Uh, no, so that's the end of that. And yes, for the leaky replacement. Okay, there's a few other things I want to go over. Um, the first one is called the panda principle. Now, as you may know, uh, the panda has a um, has this thumb. But if you also look at these other digits, one, two, three, four, five, well, does a panda have a sixth digit? Well, not from these are all phalanges, these are all homologous. Um, the ancestor of a panda was a carnivore and needed a, um, a kind of more rigid thumb. And so, this is actually the panda's thumb for grasping bamboo and climbing in bamboo is actually the sesamoid bone that um, individuals with um, kind of bigger sesamoid bones did better. And eventually, um, a kind of thumb in the pandas evolved. Um, and this is, but it's not the same kind of thumb. It's kind of a convergent thumb. So, what the panda principle, though, does mean is, does evolution by natural selection need to be perfect? Well, no, and it rarely is. It just has to be good enough. And, in fact, that's what we see in nature. Things that are kind of... Um, jerry-rigged, Mickey Mouse together. You can't um, create something if there isn't some basis for it already in uh, the phenotype or the genome. So most adaptations are imperfect because they are not designed and um, brand new for doing new things, but they arise from previously existing traits. Okay? So Natural selection can only work on existing variation uh, and not creating new variation. I mean, creating new variation, mutations, but they're rare. Um, and so it's kind of this jury-rigged uh, Mickey Mouse engineering, uh, like the panda's thumb, which eventually it was a sesamoid bone that got bigger and bigger. It's not the greatest thumb, but it's good enough. So this is... Um, a really important principle because people sometimes think that evolution by natural selection is will always make the optimum and it hardly is evolution progressive in complexity and in intelligence um, some more organisms more highly evolved than others well 
Now, older, I mean, more recent um, taxa are more complex, but just think about it. The early or organisms, earliest, were bacteria, so things could only get more complex. There are some taxa that actually were complex and then became simpler, okay? So, there are no better organisms. There are some that are more highly intelligent. There are some that are more complex. There are some that have much less intelligence but are very, very good at what they do. Insects, for example. So, organisms are not just better, just better fit to their current environment. So an adaptation is beneficial in one environment, might be a liability in another. Is a wolf's fur coat better when it's longer or shorter? Depends on the climate. Evolution requires a will to adapt. No. Remember, it's like a sieve. Or like panning for gold. Um, individuals with certain traits that increase their fitness, either from survival or reproduction, leave more copies of themselves. A bacteria can't have a will to adapt because it doesn't have a will, because it doesn't have a mind. So organisms do not evolve by creating adaptations. Remember, adaptations are not created. Adaptations arise randomly. And those adaptations that confer Increased evolutionary fitness leave more individuals. So individuals have, have a variety of um, variations among them, and those variety, heritable variations, those varieties that are better suited to the current environment, leave more offspring. Okay? So, um, those variants are well adapted and reproduce more successfully, but remember there's inheritance. And then, of course, evolution happens as populations change um, in time with these successful variants replacing the less successful ones. <clears throat> Do organisms act for the good of the species? Is infanticide in, let's say, lions... Um, good, uh, where uh, um, rival males come in and try to uh, kick out the, pri the pride males that are already there. Well, if they can do it, doesn't happen very often, but when they can, they'll end up um, killing all the cubs. They'll also cause all the females to abort uh, any fetuses that they might have for preg from pregnancy so that they can then breed again as quickly as possible. Okay? Now, part of um, Darwinian evolution is this idea that there's um, uh, competition um, and there's a kind of small-scale competition, let's say, for resources, but in terms of the big thing is competition in terms of leaving um, a greater number of offspring. If there's competition, that means individuals have a, a self-interest and not for the good of the species, which is a group interest. So individuals are being, those with good variants are being favored over other, others that don't have them. So how can it be for the good of the species? It's for the good of the individual. It's not even for the good of the individual. It just so happens that some uh, individuals have higher fitness. Um, is, if evolution by natural selection is true, then my belief in religion is false. Um, well, if you want it to be that way, you can have it that way. But um, knowing that evolution is true doesn't require you to give up religion. Um, but I will say that um, a lot of people who understand evolution um, don't believe in God. Um, this is a flying spaghetti monster um, touched by a newly appendage. This is actually a takeoff from the Sistine Chapel in Rome. 
with um, God leading to Adam. Um, most of the problem in this country is that there are fundamentalists who look at the Bible as the inerrant Word of God, even though the Bible that a lot of them read is the King James Bible. Um, there were earlier Bibles that are slightly different. There are later Bibles that are slightly different. Um, the Eastern um, uh, Christianity, like uh, Orthodox in Russia and Greece and stuff like that, um, their Bible is a little different. Okay? So, um, but a lot of them say you can't believe in the Bible, what's written in the Bible, and evolution by natural selection. Well, it's foolishness. So keep in mind the definition of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, a change in the genetic makeup or the phenotypic makeup, phenotype of the population across generations due to differences in reproductive fitness. What do you think? And um, so, do individuals evolve? No. Um, individuals do change over their lifetime, of course. Um, but in terms of individuals, natural selection just sorts the existing variants. Um, evolution requires a will to adapt? No. Populations have variation among individuals. Those variants happen as well. Is evolution progressive in complexity? No. Do organisms act for the good of the species? No. Does selection always make species better adapted? No, not all the time. You can have selection where you end up with maladaptive um, traits. Perhaps in you have traits that don't fit in the current environment. Is evolution by natural selection perfect? No. It doesn't have to be. Um, also, going back to this idea of um, the good of the species. Um, I'll give you an example of... You can actually have evolution by natural selection at many different levels, including the gene level, the cell level, the organ level, the individual multicellular organism level, the group, um, the population, okay? But I want to look at cells, uh, and we're going to cover this uh, in the next chapter, um, cancer. Now, if you think of cells as individuals instead of part of a large group that's all supposed to work together, um, or it has to work together well, or you don't have life. Um, so what happens is a cancer, there's a cell that um, uh, is able to reproduce uh, with no holds barred. It's like a, a, a pirate on a rampage, okay? And those individuals, those cells, um, nothing is stopping them now. So they have a trait that is actually increasing in their numbers. They're leaving more offspring, daughter cells, than other cells in the body, which are being restrained by all these different systems, anti-cancer systems, tumor suppressor genes, all sorts of different things. Okay, now, the cells proliferate and you get a tumor. And then the cells invade surrounding tissue and then also they start um, metastasizing, which is traveling, eventually cancer kills the individual, they kill themselves. So obviously there's no foresight there, and this is a, a trait that's a evolution in terms of cell, leaving more, uh, more daughter cells than other cells, uh, taking more resources. It's certainly not optimal, Okay, so um, it just so happens that these cells, in terms of leaving more daughter cells, are better at, are, are not better at it, they just happen to do that because tumor suppressor genes aren't working on them anymore. There's been too many mutations or something like that. Okay? And then you can go over these different things.